Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Wonderful, wonderful. So good to see all of you. Um, we're going to get started this morning with our worship. And so just wanted to say a word of prayer. Bow your heads with me, please. Lord, what a privilege it is to be here this morning. Um, we are doing something biblical, something that you called us to do, to meet together, to encourage one another, to love one another, to challenge one another. And so we get to do that here together, and we're going to purpose to worship you together this morning, Lord. God, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. There's a translation that says you ride on the praises of your people. And we don't know exactly what that means, God, but we do know that when we praise you, when we worship you, when we set our hearts in your direction, you meet us there. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do that this morning, that you would encourage every single soul as we pour out our worship, as we give you a sacrifice of praise, as we say that we love you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 That is one of my favorite songs. I love that song. You weren't kidding, Tim. You do like that spot right there where you can't see me. Yeah, I know. I, it's a blessing to have your face blocked. <laughs> <laughs> just duck down. I'm going to leave that go today. I'm going to be, be the bigger man, literally and metaphorically. <laughs> I'm teasing. Yeah. So here we are, finally down to the end. We've come to the last one of the commandments, the Tenth Commandment. I know it feels like sometimes so you never get to the end. Um, and we've split it up and done some other things. But here we are on the last one, talking about God's rating. Look at the Ten Commandments. Here it is, last one. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everybody, everyone. We talked about this last week, right? When we talked about, well, well let me, before I say that, what did we talk about last week? Let's give it, we'll have a test. What did we talk about last week? Which story from the Bible? Samaritan. The Samaritan. Thank you. <laughs> Bailed all these old people out that couldn't remember. <laughs> That's right. We talked about the Good Samaritan. And the one who was the neighbor, we talked about who are you neighboring, the one who was the neighbor to the Good Samaritan, or to the man who was hurt was the Good Samaritan. So our, we saw that our, our neighbor is really anybody, right? And everybody. So I must not covet my neighbors. Let's just switch that word with anybody's. I must not covet anybody's house. I must not covet anybody's wife or husband, male or female, servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to anybody else. Don't covet. That seems a bit out of place with idolatry, murder, theft, idolatry. Don't covet. It just seems like this one's a thought crime. Right? It happens inside your own head. So it's a, it's a victimless crime that doesn't hurt anybody, right? That's what it seems like, and that's what some people might say. And it actually comes natural to all of us. The, do we have to teach our kids that when somebody else picks up one of their toys, they go over and punch them and take it? They do that naturally. They do that naturally. Yeah. We, we don't have to teach them. to be, it, Why? Because it's our sin nature. It's inside of us to want what somebody else has. And a lot of times we don't realize we want something until somebody else has it. I, I didn't realize that I wanted 10-foot ceilings in my house. My, my 9-foot is great until I walked into their house and saw how much greater that was. So now I have to have it. You know, I didn't realize how great my own spouse was until I saw someone else flirting with them. And now, oh, man. It's only when somebody else tries to take or has what we have or want that we really start to be, think, man, I want that. And if we're not careful, it'll consume our mind to where that's all we can think about. I've got to have it. How do I get it? How can I get it? The Hebrew word that's used here for covet is the word lakmad, and it means 
to want to the point of seeking to take away and own something that belongs to another person. I am looking to take it from you so that I can have it for me. It's, it's just this narcissistic longing to fulfill these self-centered desires with another person's possessions. It's selfish and it's evil desires that lead us to selfish and evil deeds. The Oxford Dictionary uh, describes covetousness as the inordinate and culpable desire of possessing that which belongs to another or to which one has no right. It's not just something that someone else has. It's something that I have no right to have because it's not mine. In other words, coveting something is an illegitimate desires. It's something that I'm not supposed to have. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with noticing what somebody else has uh, and thinking that that's nice, but that's not where most of us stop. We don't just think, oh man, that's really nice. Thank God that he's blessing them with that big, beautiful new truck. <laughs> or that new Harley. <laughs> we don't stop there. We don't just think, God, thank you for blessing them. That's so cool that they get to have all of these nice things. They got a new house. Thank you for blessing them, God. They got a raise. Thank you, Lord, for blessing them. That's not what we think. It's what we should think, but it's not what we think. Lord, how come you gave it to them and not me? What am I doing wrong? I want that, Lord. Why didn't you give it to me? See, we stop being thankful for all that God has given to us. And we, when we start to look at what other people have, and we begin to covet to covet means to crave or desire, especially in excessive or improper ways. Coveting is an immoral longing for something that's not rightfully mine. And that usually it's usually because we're coveting something that someone already has, something that someone else has. It belongs to them. I see you. I see that you've got it. And I think, man, I want that for me. And it becomes this selfish thing. And I start to scheme how I can get it and what I'd have to do to get it. And our culture is full of it. You turn on the TV, you'll never be happy unless you have this kind of car. Your life will be fulfilled if you use this kind of soap. You know, all of these commercials, they're geared to make you covet what they're advertising and what they're selling. Our whole world is filled with it. It's, it, it, it advertised, it's everywhere. They try to get us discontent with what we have so that we want something we don't have that my neighbor does have. That's coveting. And that's what marketing is. It gets me to want something that I don't have. It, it makes me covet. I can only be happy and content once I have it. Then my life will be fulfilled. I've got to trade in my car that's only five years old to get one that's brand new my phone that works is not the newest one so i have to have the newest one i've got to have it, it can be anything it can be a car a boat a tv it can be a house it can be that phone it can be anything it can even be a lifestyle it can even be a job it can even be the way that we look. People struggle with body image because of covetousness. I want to look like God, God, look how they look. They lost all that weight so easy. Why can't I? I don't look the way I should, and I'm coveting that that they have. We live in a culture that breeds dissatisfaction. And some people may not think it's a big deal because it's just a thought that's in your head, but it goes far deeper than that. At the very core of covetousness is the belief that anyone or anything other than God can meet my deepest needs. That will make me happy. We think it all the time. I'd be lying if I said I didn't struggle with it. I had a port put in this week and I'm really sore and it goes up into my carotid artery and I got this big mark on my neck and, and all of this stuff and, 
and I'm sitting there thinking while they're doing the surgery, getting ready for the surgery, I'm like, I'm young. Why am I dealing with this, God? Why is there so many other healthy people out there and I'm stuck with this? Then I go into the cancer center to get the two units of blood and I'm seeing all of the, I'm the youngest guy in there by far. Made me feel pretty good. And then it didn't make me feel very good because I'm, God, why am I dealing with this now? This isn't fair. And it made me start to covet the life that other people have. See, I'm putting my belief that my happiness comes from being healthy. And it doesn't. Anybody who trusts in something other than God is going to be disappointed. We fall victim to the myth of more. I have to have more. I have to have that. I have to have something else. Because there's no, no thing, there's no one and no thing that can satisfy the deepest needs of my life other than God. He's the one who fills me up. The core of this, this whole thing of coveting and wanting something that I don't have that is not mine, it's all about worship. Worship is attributing worth to something else. It's, I have to have this. I am focused on this. I am putting worth into this. I am valuing this. This is something that is special to me. I'm focused on it. And I begin to worship that which I do not have. So it all comes down to worship. Worship is just that attributing worth to something else. And we were made to worship. As human beings, we're made to worship. The question is, who or what do we worship? And it's easy for us to worship the things that we want because we see it and we begin to want it. We begin to crave it and I've got to have it. And it's, man, it's so easy. Turn the TV on, drive down the road. It doesn't matter where you are. Walk into work. Somebody's going to have something that you don't have that you want. So it happens. What is it that we're worshiping? Are we worshiping the gift, the thing, or are we worshiping the one who is the giver of everything? It all starts in our mind. All starts in our head. And it's so important for us to remember that that's where all sin starts, is in our mind. We begin to think. And it's, it's rooted in the idea that God can't be trusted. It's thinking that God is shortchanging me or cheating me from something that I justly should have or I deserve or something that's out there that's better than what I have. And it usually leads to our desires and, and, and of wanting more leads to I've got to have, and it begins to take over us. And it's, it's our desire for more that leads us to all the other sins. Scripture is full of examples of this, okay? Let's go all the way back to the very beginning. Before Adam and Eve. What was before Adam and Eve? Yeah. Heaven. God still, he's, he's, created, he's outside of time. Lucifer is in heaven, one of the archangels. He was covetous and wanted the position of God, remember? He wanted it for himself, and what happened? He got kicked out of heaven. He is Satan. He's the one who's the deceiver of the brothers. Isaiah 14. Adam and Eve coveted the divinity and immorality of, or, or immortality. Not immorality of God. Immortality. <laughs> got to get that one straight. Immortality of God. Because they wanted to be like God. That's what the serpent told them. If they ate of the fruit of the tree, they could have knowledge and they could be just like God. They coveted that. David coveted Bathsheba and then he took her that's theft that's breaking the eighth commandment he got her pregnant breaking the seventh commandment to avoid the scandal with Uriah her husband he had him killed which broke the sixth commandment all because David coveted his neighbor's wife which is the tenth commandment the one led to the others coveting wanting something led to all that that's second Samuel 11 Ahab in the old testament the king coveted this man named Naboth's vineyard. And it, it led him to framing Naboth with false witnesses, which is breaking the ninth commandment. It led Ahab to murder him, which broke the sixth commandment. And it to where he stole his vineyard, which broke the eighth commandment. All because he broke the tenth commandment and coveted something that wasn't his. And then there's a man named Achan in the Bible, in Joshua 7. And there's a guy that goes parallel with him, Judas. In the New Testament, in John 12, whose coveting led them to break the Eighth Commandment, the Sixth Commandment, the Ninth Commandment, all together betraying Jesus to de for death, all for money, because they wanted something that wasn't theirs. You see, it's all through Scripture. 
There's even a guy who was a, a servant of one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, Elisha. His name was Gehazi. And he ended up losing his relationship with the prophet and ended up getting Naaman's leprosy all because he coveted something that wasn't his. Remember, Naaman came and the prophet told him to go wash in the Jordan River, and he did, and he came back and he offered, and God cleansed him of his leprosy, and he comes back because Naaman was very wealthy, offers the prophet all of this gold and all these clothes and everything, and Elisha says, dude, that's not what this is about. I'm not, I don't want anything. So he leaves and goes home, and Gehazi runs, the servant of the prophet, runs after him and says, oh, Elijah changed his mind. I'll take it. Covetousness. And what happened to Gehazi? He got the leprosy of Naaman. It's called the Gehazi syndrome. <laughs> Coveting. The silent killer. It blinds the individual to everything that they have and only sees what they don't have. It's a big deal. And it always leads to breaking more of the commandments. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Don't be greedy. That's covetousness and greedy. They, they go together. It's the same thing. They're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Don't be greedy because Paul says that coveting is idolatry. Being greedy is idolatry because when you covet, it becomes your God. It controls your life because everything is focused on that one thing that you don't have that you want. The Greek philosopher Epicurus said, to whom little is not enough, nothing is enough. To whom little is not enough, nothing is enough. That command reminds us that the greatest enemy to our happiness is being discontent with our circumstances. Exodus 20. You must not covet anybody's house, your neighbor's house. You must not covet anybody or your neighbor's wife, their male servant or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now think about the first commandment, and this is now the tenth commandment. They're similar because both deal with the heart. Warren Wearsby said, covetous people will break all of God's commandment in order to satisfy their desire because at the heart of sin is the sin of the heart. And I thought, wow, that's powerful. The heart of the sin is a sin of the heart. The heart of the problem is a problem in our heart. It's what we want. So we've got this first commandment that's dealing with our inner who we are. We've got this last commandment now dealing with our inner who we are. And they go together. It's like bookends, everything else. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But it all comes back to what I want. It's me and my desires of wanting things. Because money can buy medicine, and we need medicine, but it can't buy health. It can buy our house, but it can't buy our home. It can buy companionship, but not friends. It can buy entertainment, but not happiness. It can buy food, but not an appetite. It can buy a bed, but not sleep. It can buy a good life, but it can't buy eternal life. See, it's good, but if we focus on it, we're missing out on the greater. So the question is, do we struggle with coveting? Here's a little test for you. Are you ready? Fill in the blank. If I only had blank, I would finally be happy. If I only had blank, I would finally be happy. What's in the blank? A nicer house? A newer car? A different spouse? Children? Grandchildren? Good looks? You know, a, a successful career? Good health? For most of us, the blank is our functional God. It's what we're serving. It's what we're going after. It's what we desire. That's the person, place, or thing that we think we can't live without. Because coveting is the root of idolatry. I begin to worship that which I want. Here's another test for you. See how you do. Question one. Or, or it's, you, you, this is more like, you remember the Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck if? Okay, here you go. You might be coveting if you've hurt others in order to get more for yourself. You might be coveting if you're preoccupied with making and accumulating more. 
You might be coveting if you're unwilling to give up what you already have. You might be coveting if you're frequently grumbling about your house, your spouse, the quality or quantity of your possessions, and the general state of your life. How'd you do? I'm not going to look at you. <laughs> like I said, when we started this, we talked about coveting as something that's on the inside of us. It's the thought crime that people think it doesn't hurt anybody. It's just me and myself. But then Jesus came and switched everything. He came and changed everything. He changed our focus from the external, what we do, to the internal, who we are. He switched things from our emotions to our motives. Jesus said this in Mark 7. And then he added, it's what comes from inside that defiles you. From, for from within, or out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, there it is, slander, pride, foolishness, all these vile things come from within. They're what defile you. See, what's on the inside does matter. Even if it's just a thought, it does matter. It impacts the things around you. It affects others, and it has to be dealt with. So what's the antidote of coveting? Well, it's in 1 Timothy. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. This is probably one of the most misquoted verses in the whole Bible. Everybody says money is the root of all evil. They try to quote it that way. Is money the root of all evil? No, of course not. Otherwise, you have evil in your pocket right now. Get it out and put it in that box. <laughs> Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love. It's the envy. It's the coveting. It's wanting more. That's the evil. Why do we covet? Well, we want more. We want for us. We want all these things. And God says, good. You want gain? That's good. You want more? Okay. I want you to have more. I want you to have joy. I want, you to, I want to bless you. But you're not going to give it by coveting. I want to give you more. I want to do more for you. I want to be that good father who gives and gives and gives. But I'm not going to do it while you're coveting. You've got to get it through contentment. When we are content with what we have, then God can give us more. Gratitude is the antidote or the vaccine for covetousness. I read that this week. I thought that's really cool. Gratitude is the vaccine. So don't covet anything that your neighbors is basically telling us to be content with what we have. Contentment is the opposite of covetousness. So what is it that you want? Are you coveting something that's here, that's around you? Has there been something that on your way in today or while you were driving, or maybe it's been this week, you're thinking, man i got to figure out how I can free up enough money for the down payment to finance that. <coughs> I've got to have this. This is what I want in order to be happy. What is it that you want? Or are you content with what God's given to you? Are you seeking the things or the giver? Are you seeking the giver of the things? It reminds me of the old song, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. The second verse says, I'd rather have Jesus than worldly applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Yes, I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Is that your heart? Or is it, I've got to have this. 
See, it's so easy for us to slip into that envy, that lust, that, that, that coveting of something that's not for us, that we don't have, that's not mine, that's not even rightfully supposed to be mine. Or am I chasing after that? Or am I chasing after Jesus? So let's talk about it. What stands out to you in this last command? I want peace. Peace? That's a good thing. I second that. I've had everything else. Peace, peace is, a, uh, is a privilege. Marcus gave you everything else. Now you just want peace. Right? <laughs> 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 probably, yes, yes. Probably, probably reciprocal. <laughs> she, she's rolling her eyes. Back on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and kind of, it just kind of conveys how big a problem we have. You know, um, it's, it's a problem of the heart. It's a problem of our minds. Um, and even after walking with Jesus, it's a problem. Um, so it's a reminder that, gosh, we just need, like, we need to be saved. There, there's something wrong with us. Uh, sin has absolutely corrupted who we are. And we need Jesus. We need a Savior. Um, and again, even walking with Jesus, it's something that we struggle with, but um, thanks be to God. <laughs> uh, I was going to get ahead of Ruby today because she knew the last commandment we studied, thou shalt not lie, you know, bear false witness, so I thought, I'm going to see what the tenth one is. <laughs> Should know it, but you know, you forget them all. And uh, so when I found out it was covetousness, you know, I, uh, I, looked, I looked it up. Oh, covet, you know, that's the Tenth Commandment. So then it caused me to do a little study, you know, about it. And uh, so I thought, well, now I get ahead of Andy a little bit, you know. <laughs> that doesn't make a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it dawned on me that uh, when you covet, uh, you break so many more of the commandments, you know, just like you mentioned, uh, David and uh, <clears throat> all these other guys that broke all these other commandments because they coveted, you know, and uh, and maybe that's why God put that the tenth, you know, I don't know, but uh, yeah, when you covet, you lie, it, it can cause you to steal, bear false witness, you know, you just break them on down the line, and uh, so. It kind of hit me how important that commandment is to us today, you know. And sometimes we feel like, well, what are we studying about the Old Testament for, you know, and the uh, Ten Commandments, you know. We're, we live in, we're not under the law anymore, but those are God's guidelines for us to live by, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's good to study stuff like this. Yeah. Starts off with the first one. What's the first commandment? Uh, Tim will tell you. Tim will tell us. What's first commandment? Honor thy God. Honor thy God. Honor thy God. Yeah. 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 So, is that an outside one or an inside one? Then he finishes up with this. So, now, inside, then a bunch of outside, then inside. Because Jesus came and flipped everything from the outside to the inside. Uh, I thought that was really cool too. Yeah. Andy, I, there's just a, more of a, a question and a statement. It, it's, there's nothing wrong with wanting nice things. That's why I, I said that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where's the line? You know, that's 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 where it gets a little sketchy. Mm -hmm. um, because I could be very. I mean, you may want the next promotion. That there's nothing wrong with having a, a better job and a nicer car and all that. Um, but I think the key here made it clear was 
be thankful for what you have at the same time. And I guess maybe don't let it consume you. I mean, there's a that's the thing. Are you consuming it, or is it consuming you? Yeah. Because I, I mean, I'll admit there's been times in my life where, I mean, I'm ate up about getting that motorcycle or whatever. <laughs> is there an exclusion for motorcycles though? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <all> right. <laughs> I mean, where it almost hurts that you want something so bad. Um, that's probably where it's wrong. Probably. And you start figuring out <laughs> and start figuring out how you can get it. Yeah. And then you break another commandment and lie to your wife about how much you paid for it. You just don't tell her. You should ride up on it. <laughs> there are sins of omission. It's still lying. <laughs> not telling the whole truth. Not giving all the information. That's a, a, a partial truth is a whole lie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nothing wrong with wanting nice things, nothing wrong with wanting better things, but that shouldn't control my life. Yeah. And then also the neighbor aspect, too, where it's mm -hmm. you're motivated because someone else has this. Yeah. Oh, man, someone else has this. Well, I want it now. That's right. They can't have something nicer than me. I have to have the best and the coolest and the nicest. Well, I no, was I mean? rationalized, but I want something very close to that, very, <laughs> very similar to that. <laughs> See, there are no the trips. There are no there are no loopholes in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I think all of this takes a lot of like really deep self like introspect because these are things we don't want to know about ourselves or we deny about ourselves. We say like I'm not really I'm not really coming. I'm just you know, and we just make excuses. So it's about really digging deep inside and being honest with yourself about what you really are coveting. Mm -hmm. How deep, sorry, how deep does coveting really go though? Like beyond physical, you know, tangible things. Um, you know, you all know that I've been serving, you know, Tom and his family for seven plus months and doing all these things for him and um, I'm on my way transitioning out of that and there's a lot of um, it's been really rough the transition as a whole um, there's a lot of moving pieces but there's a lot of communication and a lot of responsibility that has to be handed off and the, it's just been a rough process you know um, with the family and I and it is not how I imagined it was going to be you know in my mind it was going to be this whole like Things are gonna be perfect. There's gonna be this great handoff, this great transition. I'm gonna march out. I'm gonna hand this paperwork over, and somebody's gonna take my place. It was everything but that. And so I feel like, you know, with cut, I'm not gonna say the word because I've mispronounced it ten times out loud in my head. Uh, the coveting word that you said. I feel like that could also go towards like the anticipation I had and the ideal that I had and the desire that I had. And there's got to be pride involved in that, and a level of it's about me and not about the whole the whole reason of why I've been doing it, mm -hmm. the whole purpose. And it's always been this is what God's called me to do. I'm doing it because I'm advocating for them because God's willed me to do that. And it became about me on the way out. And I'm like, how could it be about God this whole time and on my way out? All of a sudden, I'm like, but what about me? You know, and I feel like there's a level of that that I feel, and that's where that introspection really came, and where I had to really stop and search myself and really think about it and be like, it's still not about me. It's definitely way less about me now than it has been during this whole time. Um, but I feel like there was a level of that that I was dealing with, you know, with dealing with all this stuff on the way out. So I feel like it's a lot more than just tangible stuff, because I don't have to tell anybody that. None of y'all have to know about that. Y'all could have thought I was this saint doing all these things and that it's been this easy oh, process. Oh, we know you're Rachel. And, <laughs> but, but you can ask, ask Marcus or Nanami about how many angry, sad, you know, frustrated days I've had the last few weeks trying to deal with this. Um, and it has really broken me down in a good, in a good way, heavy, but in a good way um, to remind me that it's not, it's still not about me. Yeah. Like it's still not about me, and like I was holding on to that as some, some sort of like reward almost. I feel like internally that I was going to have this something that I was going to get to leave with, 
but that was still coveting something for myself, and it was never about me, so it still can't be about me. And I feel yeah. like, like I said, or like she said, like there's that inward part that we don't have to tell people. You don't have to let anybody else know, but if you're not identifying it and working it out, then that becomes a form of resentment that I'm going to yeah. start carrying about the work that I did, which, again, breeds other things. You know, leads on to other stuff, so. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, that's it. Very good. When you were reading the verse before your sermon, I was doing pretty well. I was like, well, I'm not coveting anybody's wife or their donkey or anything. And the, and the Connie leaned to me and said, that includes cars. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Leave it to the Holy Spirit on your wife. Yeah. <laughs> and I was watching a Meekum car on yesterday. Uh -oh. And I saw a mid-60s Corvette that looked like one I owned back when I was in my early 20s. And it's like, oh my gosh, I could just feel <laughs> those feelings like, what would I do to get that car? And they even have up there on the board payments as low as, because people will actually finance it, you know. And I found myself like, ooh. <laughs> but it went for $155,000. Uh, but... Uh, uh, think about how the, the whole advertising industry would just fail if we didn't covet because it wouldn't have anything to work on. You know? yeah. yeah, that's a great illustration though of payments as low as. That's, yeah. that's how can I get. That's that. No, yeah. Double your offer absolutely free. Yeah. yeah. But wait, there's more. Yeah. Yeah. There's more. We'll absolutely free. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, let's not covet this week. When you start to feel that coming up inside of you, let it be a, a red light that gets your attention, uh, like a big flashing light. I need to be content with what I have, and I'm going to go after Jesus with the same amount of fervor I would go after that thing. <coughs> Who's closing us? David. David? All right. Uh -oh. I would have gone for rides with you in that Corvette, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> if you get it, I'll go for rides. <laughs> uh, it's just a good reminder that those feelings of covetousness that we get, if we could turn those towards the Lord Jesus and our relationship with the Lord Jesus, thank the how wonderful it would be if we could devote that kind of energy mm -hmm. to our relation with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's kind of keep that thought in our mind as we uh, go our way today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we do pray that we would just, whenever we have those covetous feelings, we would just turn them to you uh, and feel that way about you and feel that way about our relationship with the Lord Jesus, Father, and, and just turn our love for you up a notch, Father, whenever we feel those, those sorts of feelings. Lord, we just... Uh, we're so thankful for you, for everything you have given us. Every single gift is more than we ever deserve, Father, and we just uh, have that feeling of thanksgiving towards you. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would be with us and help us to uh, go out our way this week and put feet to our faith, Father, uh, and live the way that you would have us to live and show the love of Jesus to those we come into contact with. Uh, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.